Hello, everyone. Phil Lee returning with another episode of Civil War Chat. Today is the 20th of December. We're approaching Christmas uh, 2021. Click on the subscribe button in the lower right to subscribe to future episodes and also the notification bell in the far upper right to be notified when they are released. That's just the way YouTube does it. Uh, today's topic is the wisdom versus the madness of crowds. I'll pull up my notes and we'll get started on that. Peter Thiel, who was a co-founder of PayPal, along with Elon Musk of Tesla, he was also an early Facebook investor, is famed for his thought-provoking questions. One example is a question he typically asks of entrepreneurs who are seeking venture capital from him. What are you certain to be true that most of your peers would disagree with? thought-provoking. What do you have? He's looking for what do you have a lot of confidence will happen, will be a successful business that other people aren't even thinking about because they think it's not likely to work. Now, historically, Copernicus, for example, might have answered that question by saying, well, I believe that the solar system is heliocentric instead of geocentric, as commonly believed in his day, and he would have been right. Now, a similar question concerns the wisdom of crowds. Think back to 2004, if you're old enough, when perhaps two thirds of homeowners believed that real estate prices would likely continue to rise. The ensuing rise over the next few years reflected the wisdom of crowds. The majority of the people were right. But in 2008, when probably over 90% of homeowners acted as if they thought prices would continue to rise indefinitely, the result was a speculative bubble that reflected the madness of crowds. Now, Thiel's point is that our challenge is to try and identify when the wisdom of crowds transitions into the madness of crowds, if we are to avoid speculative bubbles and extreme you know, malthinking, or I guess a lack of a better word. Now, this can be applied to Civil War history. For example, when two thirds of historians contend that slavery was a prime or a chief reason for secession of the seven cotton states, they were probably right. But when 98% believe, as they do today, that it was the only important cause of secession, and that secession caused the war, they are probably wrong. Instead of thinking things through for themselves, they yield to a herd instinct. And the only way to validate the herd is to extrapolate the condemnation of the South until the tenants collapse upon themselves. Such extrapolation has become manifest in several ways. One is that demands that Confederate statues be contextualized, escalated into demands that they be removed, and then escalated into demands that they be outright destroyed, in some cases by via meltdown. Another way is failing to recognize that the Confederate Constitution banned subsidies for private industry, restrictive tariffs, and public work spending. All three of those were non-slavery reasons for forming a new nation among the seven cotton states. So obviously slavery wasn't the only factor. Otherwise the Confederate constitution would not have had those three stipulations which are different than the US constitution. And the third way is to completely miss the point that the seven cotton states could have been allowed to leave peacefully, thereby avoiding civil war and ridding the union of slavery. So what I'm looking at here are ways that when 98% of historians agree that oh, the South was all bad, they overlook these points because there's nobody looking to, under, uh, to examine the dominant interpretation for its weaknesses and its faults. 
So they overlook these things that are weaknesses and faults in the dominant opinion. So they completely miss the point. Secession did not have to lead to war. The Soviet Union, uh, 12, 12 countries seceded from the Soviet Union and there was no war. The South could have seceded and the North could have been free and rid of slavery by letting them go peacefully. Now, a fourth example of it is that uh, doesn't get examined because of the dominance of the opinion out of the academy is to realize that the North, it was the North that went to war over tariffs, not the South. The North wanted protective tariffs to transform their leading manufacturing sectors into virtual domestic monopolies. The purpose of a protective tariff was to insulate the domestic manufacturers from overseas competition. And they insulated it to such an extent that they became the monopolies or near monopolies domestically. And they, they, they don't even consider that. Anytime you argue with them about uh, the cause, the, the reasons tariff was, was a war issue, they say, well, you know, they'll try and point out that the tariff was the lowest it had been in years, but it wasn't the South that went to war over tariffs, it was the North. And they will not even look at that or question that point about their position because 98% of them have always looked at tariffs from the point of view of why would the South go to war over tariffs? They never consider, well, why would the North go to war over tariffs? Well, because they wanted to protect their monopolies, protect their manufacturing industries. That's why, but they never, never consider it. It's outside the little goldfish bowl of their universe of issues concerning the American Civil War. Let me continue. Peter Tao uses a couple of rules of thumb to identify when the wisdom of crowds has transitioned into the madness of crowds. First is to be aware when opinion X dominates over opinion, not X. X could be any kind of opinion, but we're talking about you've either got opinion X or you've got the opinion not X, which is the negative of opinion X. So when the first opinion, opinion X dominates, there is little examination of its weaknesses. When 98% of all the historians are focused on opinion X, they're not even looking for reasons why it not be, might not be valid. They're only looking for ways to sort of advance the existing path of, of uh, extrapolation of that same interpretation. And second and foremost is when advocates of opinion X have become so powerful that they do not permit debate and censor voices. When that happens, Theo concludes, opinion not X is then the more likely one to be valid. In terms of Civil War history, the dismissal of dissenting voices as so-called lost cause mythology suggests that conventional wisdom regarding the causes of the war and the comparative morality of the respective sides has transitioned into the madness of crowds. It explains the mania to demonize the Confederacy and even the common Confederate soldier without debate. It explains why PhD students in history fail to look at any research product that fails to support the North good, South bad dichotomy. It explains the monopolizations of opinion within the academy, journalism, and the cultural elite generally. They all think alike. Now let them take note. Nine days before the October 1929 stock market crash that led to the Great Depression of the 1930s, Yale economics professor Irving Fisher stated that stock prices had, quote, reached what looks like a permanently high plateau, close quote. 
It is significant to note that Fisher was an academic expert, much like the Civil War historians of today. Unfortunately, and this is a key point, academics are among the most vulnerable of all professions to a herd instinct because they are risk averse. They cannot stand the embarrassment of condemnation by their colleagues. And that's why we may see a reversal here of the tearing down of Confederate statues. The elections in Virginia in November of 2021 show that people are waking up to this madness. Defund police is clearly a madness of crowds and it's already collapsing. And if this continues, which I think it will, but I don't know, but there's a good chance that it will if you follow Peter Thiel's thinking. Defund the police collapses, critical race theory collapses, uh, hatred of white people by black people abates. And there's a room to look at Confederate history more objectively. So anyway, that's my thinking for today. I want to thank you for watching. Uh, go to my uh, go to my Amazon page, Philip Lee, L-E-I-G-H. I've got a number of books there on the Civil War. Uh, you know, please inspect them. Uh, give them five star reviews. It really helps to get five star reviews for books if you bought them and read them. It it really helps. So let me encourage you to do that. Okay, that's our show for today, and I want to thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.